Uh, well, thanks for coming to our talk. Uh, this is Images Everything about dynamic HPC repositories using Moreno. Uh, I'm Robert Budden. I'm from the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. And uh, before we start, kind of give a brief background of uh, what our machines are and kind of how we're using them, just to give you some context. Uh, so Bridges is a, an HPC resource that is about 900 nodes now. Uh, we are booting everything using OpenStack Ironic. Uh, it's a way that we use it to provision the, the resource, to, to blast out things to disk, and uh, set up Slurm on top, and we do traditional batch um, jobs on top of that, and other things like Hadoop, uh, et cetera. And then we also use OpenStack for virtual machines as well, uh, for doing um, some gateways, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But that's a little bit of background about um, what Bridges is and how we're using OpenStack currently. I'm Mike. Uh, I work for Indiana University uh, on the Jetstream project. It is a six and a half million dollar, um, 640 node uh, to petaflops of Ceph. Pretty traditional OpenStack cluster. Um, both, uh, both these systems were funded from the same solicitation from the U.S. Um, National Science Foundation. Um, so they're both they're both targeting the same audience, which is uh, what we call the long tail of science. There are, uh, when, you, when you look at all the people who are eligible to use National Science Foundation um, funded computational resources, 97% of them don't use them at all. Uh, and so both of these systems, while uh, coming from the same solicitation, uh, even target different segments of this long tail. So if you were to if you were to take the histogram of users, user count, and uh, cycles used, it's a it's a big <laughs> swoop, and we're after this bottom swoopy part. Um, and uh, being funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, we uh, we fall under the Advanced Cyber Infrastructure Directorate, which is the directorate that doesn't do science. It's the directorate that provides resources, computational resources, to all the other directorates that do science, uh, which is why our systems are a little bit different than, uh, than the cloud systems that have come before. Ours are the first cloud systems uh, for doing science, and the ones that came before are funded by other directorates, and they're more uh, about doing um, research into how to build clouds. So your chameleons, your cloud labs, those guys. Similarly to Chameleon, we have an award called the uh, Data Exocell, which has been designed to solicitate ways to, to build the hardware and software building blocks uh, for doing research. Uh, and uh, for scientific growth, that's what we've been using to uh, kind of investigate some of these things like Moreno and to do our initial studies into OpenStack, which allowed us to deploy it on bridges. So that's an also a very interesting award that we get to, to have some leeway to, to do research and to um, investigate interesting technologies that will be useful in HPC. So without uh, further ado, um, let's get into it. Uh, why dynamic VM repositories? Uh, what, what are our goals? What are the problems we're trying to solve? Um, init initially, uh, in Exceed, which is a conglomerate of a lot of the supercomputing sites in the U.S., uh, we were tasked with coming up with um, a VM repository or, or an idea on how uh, we could have a common task of, of VM images that would work across the different supercomputing sites. So if a, a researcher wanted to do some computing at Bridges for a certain type of project, but then move to another one uh, based on where they got their allocations, that they could find common environments. Um, they would have a way to, to be familiar, to spin up a similar instance and uh, repeat the science, um, that sort of thing. So. The, um, the traditional images are, they're large, they're bulky. Um, if you had a repository of hundreds of images, it would be a nightmare to kind of sync those between all the, all the sites. Um, it, that, that becomes a big time constraint just on the data, on the upkeep. Um, how do you keep those images with security patches? How do, you, how do you do those types of things without having a, an entire staff dedicated to just managing uh, bi you know, VM binaries? Um, <clears throat> And then how do, you, how do you do the versioning between them? So if somebody is using an old VM binary uh, from years back, how, do you, how can you rebuild that environment uh, reliably if you needed to? So uh, the idea we had was instead to use something like Moreno, 
um, to be able to keep the, the piece of the repository in a, a small section of code, whether it be Ansible, Puppet, something like that under the hood, combining those with Merino and Cloud in it. And that can be easily you know, version controlled. It can be downloaded. It's very small. It can be synced across all of the sites. So um, I got to bring up the security boogeyman. Um, I have personally seen people uh, throw up a VM, create a username, test with a password, password, and be rooted within half an hour. And if you're just grabbing an image from some guy that you know down the hall, uh, you don't really know how, uh, how good his practices are. Um, you don't know how well these things have been cleaned how they've been sanitized for uh, for data, whether you know there are credentials left over in there. Um, and you really don't know um, exactly what they did. You know, you don't know what the secret sauce is without, uh, you just kind of got to trust that they configured everything correctly, didn't miss anything. Um, to, to steal a, a Feynmanism, um, if you if you just grab the VM that you know, and you go through the motions, then you get cargo cult science as a service, and that's not exactly science, is it? Uh, if you don't uh, if you don't really actually know how all your stuff is built and configured, then you probably are just going through the motions and not actually doing science. Uh, and we don't really want to encourage that kind of behavior. We want to encourage good, solid science. That's that's why we. We do what we do. Uh, so if you if you build these on the fly, then they're always up to date. You don't forget anything, um, and you can always bail out. There's no uh, there's no reason you can't just fall back to your regular practices of you know good old fashioned big blobs of binaries. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, you touched on most of that, actually. Okay, so. <laughs> so uh, what were some other motivations for this project? Um, I talked a little bit about Exceed. Um, one of our ideas in the future, too, is, is to do some Keystone Federation. Uh, since we're already kind of tasked with developing the shared image repository, the next natural progression would be to have um, a central Keystone service that we can all federate with that... Um, would handle the authentication pieces and be able to, to pull these repositories either from Glance or um, from a, a standard Moreno app catalog. Um, so these are kind of things we're working on in the future. We're hoping to get um, some projects going. Uh, the other, other motivations are just contributing back to the community. Uh, we've gotten a lot out of OpenStack. So if we can kind of uh, contribute back some of the HPC characteristics that we need that we've helped develop, um, that'll go a long way to helping other people with the same problems that we were faced. Um, and also, we're both part of the scientific working group uh, that was just formed in Austin. So uh, we've been fairly active in there. We're on IRC. Um, if you ever want to come to our meetings and find out what we're doing, uh, this is a big, a big spin-up point for us well to, uh, to help with that and to, to further the science. Um, so putting it to use, where, where do you start with these, these dynamic images? What are, what are we trying to do? Um, so obviously you, you have your base images, your minimum installs. Um, most of the people doing research are doing some type of development. So we need to build these development environments, build the libraries out, find a way to offer them uh, the different versions, say, of Python with the different um, libraries that, that, are, that are, they're built with, embedded with. Uh, a lot of these turn out to be web portals. So we see a, a huge influx of the need for somebody that has a, an Apache web setup that needs to talk to uh, a large HPC resource, whether it be the distributed file systems underneath or whether it would be to submit jobs to the batch scheduler in, in an automated fashion. And that, that's a big point for us. We have tons of different science gateways that are doing that. We have people that want virtual clusters that want to spin up a little mini cluster of torque and kind of do their own thing inside of there, uh, which we can do with, with OpenStack and hopefully with Moreno as the automation piece for this. Um, I talked about the offloading. For, for bridges, that's what we mostly see is people wanting to offload jobs uh, through Slurm using some kind of a science gateway web portal. Uh, we also, have, uh, at both sites, we run lots of Galaxy instances, which is um, all kinds of genomics data, uh, 
in that. Okay, so we'll crawl first before we walk and run. Um, you know, the, the most basic, easy thing to do is throw out a bunch of cloud init scripts that uh, that people can use to, to get going, right? You know, so a uh, few lines here, you, you fiddle with syscontrol and, uh, and upgrade your packages. You know, this is, this will get you going. Let's get you started. Install some packages. Pretty straightforward. This, this is, everybody here should be fairly comfortable with this. Uh, uh, you can drop out scripts that do stuff and then turn around and run those. So um, why do we need this? Uh, what's happening that we need orchestration? So when we have these mini clusters that we need to spin up or some of these more complicated instances that are just more than one VM, we need something to facilitate starting the instances, uh, some kind of a template to say, hey, this node is going to be a metadata service, these nodes are going to be IO services, um, these are going to be clients, this needs torque, this needs that. So we wound up needing a lot of things like heat uh, templates, and Moreno kind of gives us all of that um, automatically. When you build the Moreno package, it's going to have the heat template inside. It'll set up all the differences for the, inst um, the different types of instances and then provision the software on it as you need it. Um, these are all reusable. Uh, again, it, it allows you to do collaboration with repeatable work, which is very neat. Someone can run the same, same Moreno package and get the same software environment that they had on, on Bridges as they would on Jetstream. Um, so why Moreno, again? Um, the great thing is, is these complex environments, is it's, it's easy to package all of this up, uh, give this environment to the users, um, the users don't need to know how it works, essentially. They, they know what they're getting is, you know, this version of Python, this version of, of um, that code. Uh, this standard environment that they're used to, but they don't have to do all the installs. They don't have to do all the upkeep. Um, so it's kind of on-demand computing um, without having them needing to do any security updates or be patching the VMs. They can just spin the new instance up and get all, all, all of these, these features. It's also, it's easy to translate and transport this to and from different um, clusters. Uh, so we're hoping to build this catalog that can be shared across the resources that users can contribute to. If they, we often see users coming in and saying, hey, we need this software package, we need this version, this is what we're trying to do, and we, we end up working with them with user services. But if we could ha have that, all that dialogue and all that conversation go into a Moreno package, the next person that comes and needs the same request, it's already been fulfilled. On multiple occasions, uh, I've worked with very bright, capable people. I dare say they can run circles around me. And I've had this exact interaction um, because they aren't used to building out a virtual infrastructure. Uh, so it involves four or five calls back to me to help them walk them through all the steps that they need to do. And if you have a packaged environment, then we can, we can skip all of this. And it looks a lot more like this. So they get their credentials, they log in, click, 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 go. Wait three minutes for it to deploy, and that's it. We're off and running. So we've seen some of the cloud init scripts that Mike showed. They're, they're relatively easy. You can do things like, pa like install packages, run scripts. Um, the harder part is, is really getting that good heat template. Um, and uh, kind of having this all together is an order of magnitude. If you've looked at, at some of the Moreno things, it, it's very challenging at first. You look at the, the PL language and uh, having to, to kind of write out the UI if you do that yourself manually. Um, so there was kind of a learning curve to, to Moreno. And just from our initial uh, interest in it, um, we were like, wow, there's a lot of things you can do. It's very powerful, um, but it will take a little bit of work. The, the, uh, the great thing is that because of what you can wrap under Moreno, we're hoping we can take a lot of our infrastructure, like, say, Puppet Ansible scripts that we already use on HPC to deploy things, and then put the Moreno wrapper around those and turn those into um, apps and add that to our catalog. Right. Uh, so setting up Moreno itself, it's relatively new. It's fast moving. Um, you're going to need some extra pieces. You need a uh, 
RabbitMQ that is user-facing. At last I heard it cannot be uh, an HA cluster, so don't, uh, don't waste your time on that. Um, and as, as with most things in computer science, you, you solve everything by putting it in a black box with an abstraction. And when you do it with this, uh, you start losing the ability to find where everything went wrong. So it gets kind of challenging to, to debug it. Um, so we found that your, your best bet is to start back at the beginning and build these, build these things up, uh, up into packages rather than try and start from the package and work your way down. So I guess I, I got ahead of myself. I touched a little bit on this, but um, when it's hard to kind of sell everything with, with moving all of the infrastructure into cloud in it um, and into Moreno, you can really just use Cloudin as the wrapper to, to execute your Ansible or your Puppet or, or your other configuration management tools. Um, we have all kinds of, of old things like CF Engine that have just been legacy codes or legacy um, configuration scripts that are laying around. We can easily still use those under Moreno just by having Moreno install the packages or have Moreno use Cloudin to install these packages and execute the, things like CF Engine or Salt or Ansible or Puppet. Uh, w which is really cool to, to leverage all of this infrastructure we already have. Um, w one of the uh, the use cases we have for for this as well is at PSU we have a lot of these managed VMs, is what we call them. We're a little worried about giving users root um, in some of the VMs, and some of them they can't because they want access to our uh, parallel file systems, which if we give them root on our luster, they can mess with anybody's data. So we have this notion that we wor wind up working with developers to set these VMs up, um, they configure their, their they convey their, their needs to us. We help work with them to get the packages installed, to get the configurations up and running. And if a lot of these packages are the same, instead of having user services sit down and do this over and over again, we can get these things into Puppet, into Ansible, wrap them into a Moreno package, and then have user services be able to go through the horizon, spin up the VM, uh, select you know click on on the Moreno apps catalog, and select all the different pieces that these researchers need. And that can take some of the burden off of, um, you know, the back-end people from having to do these manual installs. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we have 40 named partners on the Jetstream grant. Uh, so here's our obligatory logo slide with uh, a, sm a handful of these partners. Uh, yeah, also for, um, some links about bridges if anyone is interested in, in kind of what we do. Um, how we do that, there's some links here. There's links to the, the data Exacel for doing uh, these different researchy type uh, projects. If you're interested in experimenting with things, we can help facilitate with some of that. Same thing for, uh, for Jetstream, links, documentation. Uh, we put some of our, uh, we put our configuration management uh, up in GitHub so you can look over my shoulder and see what I'm up to. And uh, that, questions? There's one thing I forgot to mention, interesting, um, I should have put a slide in, but interesting use case. So the first Moreno uh, proof of concept I did was to wrap a, an automated install of DevStack. <laughs> so I wound up trying to do this. I was going to ho hopefully have it working for you today. I was going to do DevStack instead of DevStack using Moreno. Uh, unfortunately, don't try to do it because nesting DevStacks is a huge mess and uh, it doesn't work. But <laughs> Uh, the neat thing is, is, is seeing that Moreno did work, was able to execute the Ansible and, and spin up the dev stack, and we were able to build about half of the services before things kind of grinded to a halt. <laughs> but uh, if anybody wants to see it, we have some, uh, some Ansible on how to do that. And it works from just a standard VM for deploying dev stack and Moreno integrated all at once with just kind of a click of a button. Yeah, questions? So what version of Murano do you use? Do you use just master trunk or you use some stable branch? Uh, we were using uh, the Mataka uh, at the IU cloud. Yeah, for me, I, I was doing mostly with DevStack originally and then just um, a GitHub checkout of, of the latest for uh, the non-DevStack instance that I was testing with. 
And another question. Uh, you also mentioned that you were like packaging hit templates into Muran applications. Uh, does it mean that you used the so-called uh, hot-based Murano, uh, Murano packages, or you were writing Murano PL code on its own? Uh, well, so there's a uh, there's a Murano CLI that you know Murano create package, and you give it the heat template, and it spits out. Uh, yeah, it, it looks like a Murano template. I, yeah, I'm a little fuzzy on the details of you know. Where exactly does it convert, you know, when do you call it a Murano package versus the, the, the hot uh, mm -hmm. type? But I was just trying to understand uh, if, you write, if you wrote the Murano PL code on your own or you just used this tool to convert heat to Murano. Yeah, we were, we were targeting heat uh, because it was easier to sort of debug, like you could, you could, you, uh, well, Murano on the back end uses heat. So if you, if you start with the heat, and you get that working well, then you have a pretty good idea that of whether or not it's actually going to work when you wrap it up. Okay. Any other questions? How do, you, um, how do you let users use very old versions of packages or lock to a particular version? It sounds like a great way to keep these VMs current, but if someone's tied to a particular version of glibc or, or something else, how do you support that? Um, right, so that, that would go back into the, the uh, package manager for the, for the particular distro. So you'd, you know, you'd do pinning for whatever after, and you'd, you'd script that up. It'd be a... The other neat thing, some of the, with uh, all the pieces of Moreno being you know, text files that are fairly small, if we you know, use version controlling, we can roll back the Moreno app to a, to a prior version that maybe has those dependencies built into them, exact version numbers. So you kind of are getting the older versions without having to store the binaries around. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Blow is saying, how portable are the uh, Murano templates between different clouds? Uh, they seem to be highly portable. Uh, from uh, we have we haven't found a place where uh, I couldn't take his packages and run it on my uh, on my cloud and and vice versa. So so far so good, but uh, you know there'll always be little uh, little inconsistencies between clouds. Um, you know. It, on Jetstream, we actually have two completely separate clouds, and despite our best efforts, there are still little variations between the two. So, I think time will tell. Um, I'm hoping to put this in production. All of our stuff at Bridges is running at Liberty still, uh, so it, it may be interesting to see, well, can we spin up Moreno on the Liberty stuff that's existing before we upgrade to Newton, and how, how will the packages translate from Nataka to DevStack to, to an older version like Liberty? Um, that's a good question. Maybe we'll, we'll have some good answers. And how do you, what components do you need to, um, uh, to change to federate Murano between the two uh, sites, do you think? That is not something we've looked at yet. Where, uh, we have some other, other things in the hopper. Uh, we're trying to um, set up federated keystone uh, as, as a first step for all of the exceed resources. Um, so once we, once we get that up and running, we're planning on doing some more Federation stuff between the two, uh, but still uh, in the hopper. Uh, so the, maybe, uh, we'll have to see. So the community app catalog, um, we, of course, went through it on our first, on our first, um, first look at Murano and found a lot of stuff that was great, but not real useful for us. And I would hesitate a bit to sort of overwhelm them, pollute them with, 
with a bunch of stuff that nobody outside of you know, the, the research community would care about. And lo lots of people would love uh, a real easy Kubernetes install, but uh, not everybody wants, you know, NAMD or, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you guys. <laughs> yeah, yes. Maybe everyone in the room does. So. Yes, but there, you know, there's, you know, another uh, uh, four, what's 5,200, 900, and, or uh, 250 people probably who uh, who here at this conference who wouldn't really care about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we could easily, we both have public GitHub repositories for our respective sites, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be putting them out there. So if they are useful and, and the community finds them useful enough, then they could easily be pulled into the, the uh, you know, the OpenStack app catalog. But like, you said, like Mike said, we'd, we don't want to blast, you know, the, the app catalog with 800 different versions of Python compiled with this, running this for that. Um, Yes. Um, Absolutely. One of our reasons for, for pitching this talk today was um, so that we could get a bit of uh, bit of practice, a bit of feedback from our from our learned colleagues here uh, when we go back to exceed management and pitch this same idea that they should not have a massive uh, repository of binaries because it's it's never occurred to them that that's that there's any other way to do things. So, um, yeah, your uh, your feedback and comments would be greatly appreciated. So we can sharpen this a bit, and and make a at least for at least within the um, NSF funded resources start there and uh, and see how much how much more we can pull in beyond that. Yeah, this is very much ongoing research, and if, if there's other ways that come other other technologies something that come down the line that make this better, then we're all for it. This seems like the, the simplest way to, to have something that is dynamic and is portable. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it.